All right. Uh, good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. The Secretary General today visited Palu on Indonesia's Sulawesi Island, where an earthquake and a tsunami struck two weeks ago. In Balaroa, he saw the scale of the devastation generated by the liquefaction phenomenon, which occurred during the earthquake. He said it was impossible not to be heartbroken by what he had just witnessed. The Secretary General also visited people affected by the disasters at a nearby hospital, which had been partly destroyed two weeks ago. He then met with displaced people who had either lost their home or were too afraid to go back to their home. He spoke to families who had lost loved ones and to school children and their teacher in the camp in Jalan Balakatoa. The Secretary General said he had made the visit to express the UN's full solidarity with the people of Sulawesi and of Indonesia. He paid tribute to their resilience and said that their courage and spirit of solidarity were remarkable. The Secretary General also commended Indonesia's response to the disasters and appealed to the international community to support reconstruction. The Secretary General visited Palu with the Vice President of Indonesia, Muhammad Yusuf Kala. He also met there with the head of the Indonesian National Disaster Management Authority and the Governor of Central Sulawesi. Tomorrow, the Secretary General will participate in the World Bank International Monetary Fund meetings in Bali, where he will discuss sustainable development and climate change in various sessions. Last night, we issued the following statement on, Malaysian, on the Malaysian government's decision to abolish the death penalty. The Secretary General welcomes the decision of the Malaysian cabinet to seek uh, abolition uh, of the death penalty in the country. This decision was taken as we commemorated the World Day against the death penalty on the 10th of October. The Secretary General commends this decision as a major step forward in a global movement towards the universal abolition of the death penalty. The Secretary General seizes this opportunity to call on all countries which still retain it to follow the encouraging example of Malaysia. And uh, I've been taking a, uh, taking a few questions uh, uh, this morning about uh, the special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, Nikolai Mladenov. Uh, I can say that the UN Secretary General fully supports the efforts of special coordinator Mladenov, who, had been working tireless, who has been working tirelessly with all concerned parties, particularly with the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, and Israel, to change the dynamics in Gaza, to avoid escalation, to support intra-Palestinian reconciliation and to address all humanitarian issues. The Secretary General hopes that relieving the humanitarian pressure in Gaza will reduce the tensions that risk a devastating armed conflict in Gaza and create space for the Palestinian Authority and Hamas to engage seriously with Egypt on reconciliation and the implementation of the 12th October 2017 Cairo Agreement. However, any humanitarian response to Gaza's problems can only be temporary and limited in scope. What is needed is a political breakthrough that will restore intra-Palestinian unity under a single, legitimate national authority, a lifting of the closures in line with Security Council Resolution 1860, and ultimately progress towards advancing a negotiated two-state solution based on relevant UN resolutions and previous agreements. The United Nations is deeply concerned by the prevalence of explosive hazards, particularly improvised explosive devices that continue to kill and injure civilians in Syria. The latest such, such incident was reported yesterday when a child was reportedly killed and another injured when an IED exploded in Al Atarab city, 35 kilometers west of Aleppo city. Some 8.2 million men, women, and children are living in communities reporting explosive hazards exposed to the threat of grave injuries and deaths on a daily basis, according to the 2018 Humanitarian Needs Overview. The presence of explosive hazards is a lethal barrier to movement and delivery of humanitarian aid, and endangers those who are seeking refuge from violence. The United Nations continues to call for the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure, in line with parties' obligations under international humanitarian law. Our humanitarian colleagues in Yemen report that conflict has escalated over the last 24 hours in areas south of Hodeida City, with reports of increased airstrikes, shelling, and clashes, mainly in al Doremi and, and, and Atoheta districts. The UN is working to confirm the impact of this escalation, including initial reports of civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure. Since the 1st of June, more than 570,000 people have been displaced by fighting in Hodeida Governorate. The United Nations and partners have reached nearly all of these people with emergency response kits that include food rations, hygiene supplies, and items to preserve dignity. 
Additional assistance, including supplementary food, cash, and shelter kits, are provided to the most vulnerable displaced people based on assessed needs. Yemen remains the worst, world's worst humanitarian crisis, with 22.2 million people, or 75% of the population, in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. This includes 8.4 million people who don't know how they will obtain their next meal. The crisis is rapidly worsening due to escalating conflict and severe economic decline. The United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon Maritime Task Force participated in a search and rescue operation at sea after receiving reports on Wednesday of a missing boat off the coast of Lebanon. UNIFIL was informed that a small boat allegedly heading towards Cyprus was missing and it tasked its maritime force to locate the missing vessel. Yesterday, UNIFIL's flagship, BRS Liberal, found a small white boat northwest of Beirut with 32 passengers on board, 19 men, six women, and seven children. The boat was out of fuel and the passengers had been without food or water for four days. While waiting for the Lebanese Navy to arrive, Univil naval peacekeepers distributed water and food and provided medical assistance. After the Lebanese Navy arrived at the scene, the passengers arrived safely at Beirut's port today, escorted by Univil. The UN mission in the Central African Republic, MINUSCA, reports that yesterday it dismantled a base belonging to the armed group UPC and confiscated a number of weapons and ammunition in a joint operation in Bambari, Waka Prefecture. The same evening, a group of UPC fighters opened fire and threw grenades at MINUSCA peacekeepers who were responding to a report that the UPC was threatening civilians in the city. No MINUSCA casualties were reported. The mission has increased patrols in Bambari to protect civilians. <clears throat> the Secretary General's Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict, Virginia Gamba, welcomed the release earlier today of 833 children by the Civilian Joint Task Force in Northeast Nigeria. The CJTF, a local group supporting security forces and protecting local communities in the Northeast against Boko Haram, signed an action plan in September 2017, committing themselves to put measures in place to end and prevent child recruitment. Today marks the first formal release of children from the group since then. In her statement, Ms. Gamba expressed concern for boys and girls in the country's northeast who continue to be subjected to grave violations by Boko Haram, as well as for children detained by the authorities for their or their parents' alleged association with armed groups. The World Health Organization reports progress in the response to the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo's North Kivu province, but says a multitude of challenges, notably security in and around the city of Beni, have led to a recent increase in new cases. The agency says 39 new confirmed cases were reported between the 1st and 11th of October, 32 of which are from Benin. WHO warned that continuing insecurity se severely affects both civilians and frontline workers, forcing the suspension of the response and raising the risk that the virus will continue to spread. Meanwhile, the UN Children's Fund reports that one month after the beginning of the school year, 80% of school-aged children have returned to school in Benin and Mabaloko health, schools, health zones, the two epicenters of the Ebola outbreak. UNICEF has identified more than 1,500 schools in the areas affected by the epidemic. The UN Refugee Agency today called on the government of Australia to urgently address a collapsing health situation among refugees and asylum seekers at offshore facilities in Papua New Guinea and Nauru. UNHCR said that Australia must act now to prevent a further tragedy to, to people forcibly transferred under its so-called offshore processing policy. It reiterates its call for refugees and asylum seekers to be moved immediately to Australia, where they can receive adequate support and care. More than one quarter of the approximately 1,420 people still held in Papua New Guinea and Nauru have been returned to Australia on medical grounds. Since 2016, UNHCR has consistently and repeatedly warned of the severe negative health impacts of offshore processing, which are as acute as they are predictable. Uh, I want to flag that tomorrow is the International Day for Disaster Reduction, the theme this year focuses on reducing economic losses in relation to global gross domestic product by 2030. In his message, the Secretary General draws attention to the earthquake and tsunami in, in Indonesia and says that, dis that this disaster showed yet again the urgency of resilience and risk awareness. Disasters have a steep human and economic cost, he says, adding that keeping track of the economic losses is crucial for progress in crisis prevention. You can find his full message online. And tomorrow is also World Migratory Bird Day, which seeks to raise awareness about the importance of bird conservation. 
In his message, the Secretary General says that migratory birds are symbols of peace and of an interconnected planet, and that their epic journeys inspire people of all ages across the globe. He added that the day is an opportunity to celebrate the great natural wonder of bird migration, but also a reminder that those patterns and ecosystems worldwide are threatened by climate change. The Secretary General also urged governments and people everywhere to take con concerted conservation action that will help to ensure the bird's survival and our own. And after I'm done, you'll hear from Monica Villela Grayley, the spokeswoman for the President of the General Assembly. And then at 12.30 p.m., the President of the Security Council, Ambassador Sasha Laurenti of Bolivia, will brief on Colombia at the Security Council stakeout. Uh, yes, Joe? Yes, uh, you read out a uh, general statement of support for Mr. Miladinov's uh, uh, ongoing work in the Middle East as a special envoy. But uh, it didn't respond specifically to um, the reports of the Palestinians' decision not to uh, continue working with Mr. Miladinov. So um, I guess, number one, could you uh, give us uh, the Secretary General's uh, reaction to that decision and what efforts he is making personally to uh, try to get that decision reversed? Well, with respect, I've actually given exactly what the Secretary General's reaction is up front in what I just read. But uh, to reiterate the basic point, uh, what we've made clear is that the Secretary General fully supports the efforts of his special coordinator, Mr. Mladenov, uh, and, uh, and particularly his uh, efforts with the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, and Israel to change the dynamics in Gaza. Yeah, but with all due respect, that doesn't really address the, this, this specific action. And if that's the extent of the Secretary General's public comment right now, could you tell us if he's, con if he's planning to undertake any uh, personal intervention with the Palestinians to see if that decision of the Palestinians not to continue cooperating with Mr. Miladinov can be reversed? Uh, well, first of all, you'd have to check with the Palestinians about what precisely uh, their, their decisions are. As far as I'm aware, there are mixed signals coming uh, from different officials. Uh, I'm not aware of any formal non-cooperation with Mr. Miladinov, but where we stand with him is as I've just expressed. Yes, Abdul Hamid. No, thank you, Farhan, following on the uh, same question of Joe and uh, your comment. The PLO mem executive member committee said that Mr. Mladenov had exceeded his mandate and he is trying to arrange an agreement between Israel and Hamas, which interferes with national security of the Palestinian and its unity. So, uh, and they declare that he's persona non grata. So is that, would the SG still stand with Mladinov and force the Palestinian to deal with him? Or how it gonna, how it gonna work when, in, in a case su like, uh, such uh, like this? Well, uh, as, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Mladenov does work with the Palestinian Authority as well as the other parties on the ground, and he continues to do so. Uh, I, as I just mentioned to your colleague, there are some mixed signals from, from their side about uh, any decision on their part. From our part, uh, we have encouraged Mr. Mladenov's efforts, uh, particularly to deal with the situation in Gaza. And as I just pointed out, uh, you know, we have, uh, he has been working to relieve the humanitarian pressure on Gaza, but uh, what the Secretary General believes uh, is that we need a political breakthrough that will restore intra-Palestinian un unity under a single legitimate national authority. But he's been involved in this long-term truce agreement between Hamas and uh, Israel. Do you deny that? I mean, does the SG aware of this uh, effort on, on the part of Mr. Mladenov? Mr. Mladenov's efforts are designed ultimately to make sure that the Palestinian people, whether in uh, the West Bank, in Gaza, or in East Jerusalem, can, can uh, live peacefully and ultimately live at peace with the people of Israel. He's been working uh, conscientiously and consistently over the years with uh, the various authorities on the ground, including the Palestinian Authority, the government of Israel, the government of Egypt, and the authorities in Gaza, and he continues to do that. Yes. Just a clarification. On these 32 passengers in the boat 
Where did they come from? Where are they? Where were they going? Who are they? That that's something uh, ultimately now they're in the care of the Lebanese authorities. It's for the Lebanese authorities to determine exactly how they came to be lost at sea. Uh, but uh, but our role was involved in finding them and helping uh, bring them to the Lebanese Navy and back to safety. And I. I I don't know if you can answer this, but it's, uh, I'm confused of the Palestinian reasons uh, for not wanting Mr. Mladenov to continue. Uh, that would be a question for them, not for me. Uh, yes, please. Um, a follow-up question on Mr. Mladenov. I appreciate there are mixed signals coming from Ramallah and what the position is, but if the position is that they are refusing, the Palestinian Authority as a whole are refusing to deal with him, that would, would it not make his position completely untenable? Uh, I don't want to speculate, depend, but because as, as, as we're all aware, there are different things that have been said by different people. Uh, we'll need to see what uh, is the reality of the situation on the ground and evaluate based on that. Yes, please. Did you receive a re notification from the Palestinian? I have not received, we have not received anything formal about this okay. at this stage. Yes. In Turkey, for Jamal Khashoggi, the reporter, I mean, you know, the journalist, U.S. and got involved with this. Do you inform with what's going on with this? you have any latest what about that? Uh, well, our position on uh, Mr. Khashoggi remains uh, what uh, uh, Stefan has articulated to you over the last several days. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, hope uh, that uh, the various um, authorities on the ground will be able to investigate uh, what has happened to him, and we have expressed our concerns about the situation and about, uh, and more generally, about the treatment of journalists. Yes, Richard. Continuing on that topic, uh, since Stefan yesterday said there had been contacts with senior officials and the Saudis here in New York, since that time, has there been any further additional contacts? And I have a follow-up. Uh, th there's nothing further to report uh, uh, as of today. The Secretary General traveling in Asia, when asked, will you be contacting Saudi Arabian Crown Prince, MBS, he said, quote, we have had some contact already. Has the UN contact expanded past New York directly to Riyadh? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go beyond what the Secretary General said. Uh, he did point out, uh, and as Stefano also said, that we've had some contacts, and that is where we stand with it for now. Uh, yes, Ben. Yeah, um, more human rights abusers have been elected onto the Human Rights Council. Does the Secretary General think it's time for reform? Ultimately, on this question, it's really a question of who the member states themselves vote on. As you know, the decisions on who sits in these bodies are made by the member states themselves, and that is their sovereign right. We have urged that... Uh, that all of those who are sitting on the Human Rights Council are themselves willing to have their own human rights records looked at. As you know, there's a system of universal periodic review, and so they go through an evaluation process, and we want them to go through it honestly and to improve uh, their own situations. But beyond that, of course, I will leave you in the hands of my colleague... Uh, can I just quickly uh, follow up? General Is Assembly he not disappointed by the likes of Cameroon... Eritrea, Bangladesh, and others being voted on today. Isn't that disappointing, such countries with such poor human rights records? Ultimately, we don't evaluate or second-guess the decisions made by member states. They're the ones who choose to run people for these seats, and they're the, people who vo uh, they are the governments who vote for them. Uh, ultimate responsibility is in their hands. And with that, Monica, come on up.